Hello, Soldat! I'm the Wolf of 1918, and as you can see, I'm wearing my authentic World War I German gas mask. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Well, the asbestos is going to kill you, right? And no. The most dangerous thing to me right now is the, left, is the leftover phosphorus and chlorine gas, making it difficult to breathe. common misconceptions amongst World War I collectors and World War I reenactors is that you should never wear or have near you a complete, unaltered German World War I gas mask filter. The reason being, well, it contains dangerous asbestos, and that'll kill you. Here's where the problem comes into play. There's no actual evidence to support this claim that German World War I filters contained asbestos. No one really knows where this rumor got started. Um, in fact, it's not even really known if World War One Entente gas mask filters had asbestos within them. Granted, I haven't seen any diagrams as to what they were made of, so I can't speak with any confidence as to what they actually were. But there is a misconception, a common one, that the German filters did use asbestos. That is false. German World War One gas masks had a base of mainly activated charcoal. This was a common thing in many gas masks of World War I, but it also contained mixtures of other chemicals. I will go ahead and give an original diagram or semi-recent to World War I diagram showing the, the items used in the gas mask filters, and I will read them off to you using my phone. Well, the diagram is shown because I don't have them memorized and I don't feel like reading off a script or trying to because then I can't make eye contact with the camera. So I'm going to pretend that I know what I'm saying just by hiding it with a picture. All right, so I'm going to pronounce a lot of these words wrong, so forgive me in advance. In layer one of this diagram, you have um, the mouth layer. This is from Google Translate, so some of these are slightly wrongly construed sentences, but the names of the chemicals are correct. You have diatomite, which is basically... So in layer one, the mouth layer, the one closest to the mouth, you have diatomaceous earth, or diatomite as it is in the diagram. This is still used today and is actually something that I used to use when we had different animals out on the ranch that I live on. Uh, we'd use it to keep the flies away and it's not dangerous for humans to breathe. In terms of like, if you get powder, it's not, a, it's not any more dangerous than getting dust up your nose. If anything, it helps take care of the bugs. This diatomaceous earth was soaked with a potash solution, which is a potassium-based solution, uh, more based off the salt rocks that are mainly potassium. Based off the research that I've done into these different chemicals, it is still used for health benefit reasons today, mainly in the essential oils industry, from what I've learned. Um, then it has urotropine, or urotropine, which is also still used in the medical industry today, although to a smaller extent. Um, I wasn't, I'm not too sure as to what this is used for. I just got results that it's a medical, it's an ingredient in a lot of medical industry drugs, but it's a, like an organic compound that occurs naturally and isn't bad for human consumption either. And the last one is, this is the one that I'm definitely gonna screw up, uh, piperazine, uh, P fabric. The other one was U fabric. I'm guessing they're like fabrics made of this stuff. Again, another medical industry used um, organic compound that has been used for centuries, it's not harmful. At least to the research that we've done so far. It has no real negative effects like asbestos does. So nothing dangerous. So that's all layer one. Layer two, the middle layer, is active carbon. Active charcoal, basically. Layer three, so layer two is the basic, everyone's like, oh, they used activated charcoal. Well, what else did they use? Because activated charcoal isn't an end all. Um, so layer two is the activated charcoal. Layer three is the outer layer. It has the same filling as the one with the single layer insert, at least in 1915. I don't really have too much information on what future gas mask filters used, but I doubt that they strayed too far from this recipe. So that's what the diagram basically is. And as you can see, there's no asbestos in it. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Of course, I'm not gonna do it that quickly. That'd be stupid. I'm on the subject of gas masks. I'm not gonna end it without going on this long tangent about the history of gas masks and what you should use in your reenactment equipment or whatnot. That would be, that would be out of character. So, 
gas masks. And should you use one for reenactment even after I just told you that they're perfectly safe to use? Except they're not. Asbestos is the least of your worries. In terms of the dangers of original gas masks and using them for reenactment or even having them in the same room as you, the dangers lie within the experiences of that gas mask during the war. Gas masks went through a lot and specifically were worn during gas attacks when there was poisonous clouds of air touching this gas mask. And the thing about this air is that it's still dangerous today. People still die from touching items affected by the gas of the First World War. There are still portions of the French dead zone, the no-go zone in France, in which it's still too basically fraught with World War I munitions and death machines that people still can't go there. And it, within these areas, there are still areas terribly affected by mustard gas in which nothing grows. It is just black. Animals which pass by through there or stay there for any length of time have been recorded as dying soon after. It's awful. And there's serious effects that gas has more than a hundred years later. And it's not just mustard gas. It's the phosphine. It's the chlorine gas. It's all these different types of gases that were used during the war that still affect people that touch these gases or breathe them in today. Most gas masks aren't going to have been in contact with mustard gas. Mustard gas wasn't, a, wasn't super commonly used. It would effectively neutralize the zone as it stayed in that spot and wasn't like chlorine gas where you could just easily breathe it. It affected you even when you, weren't, even when you were wearing the mask. If it got in contact with your skin, it would blister and boil and cause serious infections down the line. So mustard gas is nasty, but you're not going to find it on many surviving World War I gas masks, at least to my knowledge. The big thing you're going to find is residue of phosphine and chlorine gas. And these are the dangerous ones for those who want to wear them or be near them while they're breathing. And this is why my gas mask is kind of about, I want to say, three feet away from me. And... two and a half feet away from me. It was probably two feet earlier. Um, and that's because it still has chlorine gas on it. Wearing it is actually pretty bad on my lungs in terms of like me being able to breathe. This might be because of the filter being so compact and hard to breathe through over the years, but it also makes it difficult to breathe after taking it off. Common effect of chlorine gas. Now, I'm not saying that I'm going off and really damaging myself and lowering my life expectancy. All I'm doing is exposing myself to non-fatal doses of chlorine gas. In fact, they're so minimal that it's not a big deal. My overreaction is probably just due to a mixture of not already not getting enough proper oxygen and then just being in this self-contained mask with slight residue of chlorine in my body just not being used to that. So, in effect, it's probably just a mixture of me being out of shape and, of course, the residue chlorine. So this is another reason why the masks aren't exactly safe to wear, especially the filters, because of that residue chlorine that sticks it within the filters themselves. This is one of the reasons why filters would eventually have to be thrown out, as they would stop being as effective as they got soaked with the chlorine compound. As the filters themselves, their job was to simply take the chlorine or whatever gas it was deactivating and not filter it out, but simply make it non-reactive. Because as that gas goes through the mask, it reacts with everything in the filter, so that there's nothing, there's no way that it can react with anything as soon as it leaves the filter. You're still breathing in the chlorine. It's just not chlorine that's gonna kill you. You're still breathing in that gas. It's just not going to kill you. It's going to keep you fighting. The filter preemptively activates those compounds in the gas so that when it comes in contact with the things on your face and your lungs, on your eyes and your nose and your mouth that it would activate with, well, there's nothing in the gas to cause that activation and it's, it's already through. That's how the filtration system works. So when you have a 100 year old gas mask that has been in a gas attack and you wear it and it's a filter that is 100 years old and you get one with a very well used filter that was probably on the brink of being replaced anyway, you're probably gonna start to breathe in those gases. Now, it's not gonna kill you, it's just putting extra wear and tear in your lungs you don't really want to experience. And if you're someone who already has problems with breathing, like asthma or pneumonia problems, that creates even more of an issue as you're going to be taxing your lungs in ways that you probably don't want to. Again, it's not going to kill you, it's just going to do something to your body that you probably shouldn't be doing as 
it's not exactly natural, and you can easily choose not to do that. You can literally just choose not to wear the mask. It's that easy. Just, just don't wear it. For the love of God. There's also the military collector side of it. The people who want to keep the historical integrity of his, of antique military intact in their original condition. And about 90% of the time, I'll agree. You don't want to be refurbishing pieces of historical interest or historical value because those things are in limited quantity. We have a finite amount of items and going off and modifying them and changing them in order to fit your reenactment needs can create issues down the road. That's why we don't have many things left of certain periods. Souvenir hunters, people who just refurbish them or repurpose them. Uh, Falschim Jaeger helmets are notoriously hard to come by mainly because after the war they were used as they they had holes drilled in them and they were used as strainers or they were used in the kitchen because they were repurposed because no one needed them anymore. And in essence, even today, a hundred years later with the First World War, people are still going off and repurposing items. For me, I don't mind repurposing something that is pretty deteriorated. If you have a rusted stall helm, and I've mentioned this in one of my previous videos, if you have a rusted out stall helm and you refurbish it and repaint it, cool, that's awesome. Do that all day long. For something like these stall helms, however, where they're in really good condition, they have some original paint left, um, and uh, they're easily reusable in their current state, you wouldn't want to repaint these. You wouldn't want to try to refurbish them. You wouldn't want to try to replace the posts for your strap because you're tearing apart the story of the helmet, the strap, you know. And the same can go for the gas masks. You don't want to go off and use them because you're putting wear and tear on the straps and people who saw me wearing it at the beginning of my video are probably sitting there screaming in their heads because, oh my God, he's wearing an original gas mask. He's putting so much wear and tear on those straps. I've done this a few times uh, with my gas mask, which didn't have a filter, which I sold a bit ago. And um, I'd like to consider myself pretty well-mannered on how to handle these things and make sure that they don't break. I'm very passionate about keeping the, these things intact, so there's no real need for you guys to worry about me mishandling these. I'm very careful with these things. And I take a lot of good care in making sure my gas mask is taken care of as I want it to stay intact for the historical value and because I spent money on it. I don't want to break it. When it comes to refurbishing these items, such as strengthening the straps or replacing the filter, there is an argument to be made for both sides. For the reenactors who want to portray the best unit they have and to find a deteriorated gas mask, which doesn't have a lot of historical value to it anyway, they kind of have a right to do so. If there's a gas mask with its straps ripped with a need for fixing, it just has a lot of issues, then yeah, go for it. Fix it up, get it in good condition. But in terms of this one, there is no way that I will remove that filter, replace it with a reproduction one, heaven forbid, fix up the straps to reinforce them in order to wear it myself, and then use it for reenactments. That would be just awful for me to do based off the condition of this mask. And as much as I might get the funny feeling to do so every once in a while, and I might want to because of the condition it's in and all that stuff, it's also too small for me, and even if I fixed up the straps, I'd probably break them after enough use. <clears throat> so that kind of breaks down the effects of uh, these gas masks, and uh, yeah, I'm not really going to go into the history of these and the differences within the models, because this was more of a video on why gas masks aren't exactly dangerous to wear in terms of what most people think. German World War I gas masks did not use asbestos. They used some things completely different that had basic similar effect. And people need to stop spreading this myth. This is basically a myth that was fabricated out of thin air. What people need to be saying is making smart arguments. You shouldn't be wearing them because you could destroy a potential piece of, you could potentially destroy a piece of history. And you're going to tax your lungs more because they have residue chlorine gas in the filters and on the mask themselves. As I have so learned from being near this thing for longer than I should. It really taxes the eyes and lungs. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, this is sort of an offbeat one. I'm sitting at my desk, I'm wearing my uniform, and I've got my stein with me filled with water, and yet I'm not talking about the Ultimate Beginner's Guide. So hopefully this is a new step in my channel towards uh, new beginnings. I also feel like I did a much better talking in this one, so hooray for that. Um, in the future, I will do an in-depth video on gas masks, their uses, the differences between German and all that stuff. But right now, I felt like this is a good enough video on gas masks just to get it out there that gas masks aren't dangerous to wear for the reasons you think. 
I hope to catch you guys in the next one. Auf Wiedersehen und tschüss.